Let me tell you something even greater than that. I believe the Lord's been blessed this morning. I believe he's received glory unto his name. Take your copy of God's Word, and I want you to make your way to uh, Matthew chapter 4. Now, uh, we're going we're gonna to navigate over to the Gospel of John in just a few moments. It will not be on the screen. Uh, it, I added it um, supplementally because it brings out a uh, different nuance of the truth that we're uh, struggling to uh, convey this morning. Uh, today, uh, we're, we're entering into a season, uh, if you remember how the Lord showed us from his word in times past, that he deals, um, we tend to live in chronos, the tick-tock of the clock. Uh, the Spirit of God tends to move in kairos, those are seasons. A calendar, a clock cannot contain them. Uh, one of the ways that you know that you're in a season is it's, it's one of those uh, divine moments when God just steps in, invades and he doesn't uh, necessarily uh, consult us. He just sets down in our midst. We are in one of those seasons in this faith family. Uh, we have themed that uh, all in. Now, all in uh, is an event that is taking place today specifically uh, in the overflow uh, to connect and serve what you're going to see today in the overflow. Uh, if your experience, if your exposure to this faith family called Fairview is limited to this room, you, I implore you in the name of Jesus, take a few chronos. Come on, y'all. Y'all got to do better than that first service. Them suckers, they, listen, they not only had decaf, I think they took Xanax or something. They were not even in the room this morning. I need you to work with me. I need you to take a few chronos and step over to the overflow because this is what you're going to discover. If your uh, exposure to this ministry is simply in this room, you are going to be um, shocked. This is a church that just doesn't sleep. Somewhere, either on this campus, in this city, or in the uttermost parts of the world, this church is either going, supporting, moving, mobilizing the gospel of Jesus Christ. So I, I want you to go over to Overflow, meet some of those that are um, in part of, uh, that they can show you part of what they're doing in their ministry. Uh, now today, we're going to be looking at specifically uh, this morning and tonight, we're going to be looking at from serving to seating. This morning, you're going to have a chance to See some of the ministries that are serving in the name of Jesus. Tonight we're going to talk about seating and revamping this room. The pastor's council will be uh, presenting that to the church family. And uh, once we're done, we'll go over to the uh, overflow and spend a few moments together fellowshipping and talking with those that are laboring. Now, what I want you to do very quickly is uh, I want you to find Matthew 4. If you don't have a copy of God's Word, uh, Matthew chapter 4 will be on the screen. But keep your Bible open and ready to navigate because I'm going to ask you to make your way over to the Gospel of John, chapter 1. Uh, are you ready for the Word? Yes. All right, watch this. Here we go. Uh, Matthew chapter 4, beginning at verse 18, and the Word says, And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon, called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Then he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. Now, I apologize that it's not going to be on the screen, but I want you to go over to John chapter 1, and I want to show you um, the, the other perspective biblically from John chapter 1, verse 35. The gospel according to John chapter 1, verse 35. Again, the next day, John stood with Two of his disciples, and looking at Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned and seeing them following, said to them, What do you seek? They said to him, Rabbi, which is to say, which is translated teacher, where are you staying? Verse 39, he said to them, Come and see. Verse 40. And one of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. Father, we pray for what money can't buy, what I do not possess. Lord, what everybody in this room knows, what you know more than anybody, including me, I cannot do what needs to be done. Therefore, I declare openly, honestly, desperately, Holy Spirit of the living God, 
I pray not only you give me the anointing to preach, God give us the anointing to hear. And let our hearts be receptive to your word that we might rise up, O oh God. And when this day is done, let it be said of those of us who have named the name of Jesus, may it be said of us, these are followers of the Christ. For it's in his name we pray, amen. Now, uh, what I want to do that very quickly this morning is I, I want to I set the tenor and the tone from the text, and I, I want to share a little bit of my experience, um, and I want to use what has potentially been a very controversial historical narrative to illustrate a very powerful spiritual truth. Uh, you, uh, if you've been attending here at any length of time, you know my testimony. I was not brought up uh, in a, um, a home that was immersed in the Bible, familiar with the Bible, wasn't brought up in a Christian home. And uh, I, I'm a little bit reluctant to say it this way, but I, I don't know how better to say it. If there were a benefit, and I'm not saying there are any, but if there were a benefit of not being raised in a Christian home, one of them would have possibly been that when I got saved later in life, I didn't have any preconceived notions about the Word of God. Simply meaning this, I wasn't raised in church that, that gave me preconceived ideas in the American understanding of Christianity. Jesus said it this way, unless you think I'm being ugly or fussing. Jesus said it this way to the very crowd that he came to present himself to as Messiah. He said, your traditions nullify my word. Meaning this, uh, theologically it's called prolegomena, pro to go before legomena, to make up your mind. In America, we have a very prescribed religious tradition that sometimes keeps us from moving into the deeper truths of God's Word. And the very thing that He wants to show us in the intimacy of His Word, because we have Americanized the text, we can't receive the deeper truths because we've already made up our mind that we know what's going on. Let, let me, let me um, just, if you would, dig a little bit deeper. There were two very defining moments in my Christian walk early on. One, uh, once I began to become a serious student and I addressed some of the uh, deficiencies that I had in my own uh, inability to study, some of the, own, uh, some of the learning in incapacities that I had, and I began to learn how to learn. Let me just pause and say this to those of you that suffer with different things that you've been diagnosed with, ADHD, squirrel, whatever that is, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, dyslexia, uh, I've got a whole list of them. Uh, my daughter uh, also, uh, I passed that on to her as a blessing. And um, I, I would tell her um, often, because the world will label you as being dumb, and that's not true. That is not true. I, I'm telling you as a believer, not only are you a new creation, but God gives you the capacity to be able to do what you couldn't do in the natural. So as I began to learn how to learn, um, I, I uh, came upon a, 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 some conflict in my own spirit. Uh, one was a historical event. I'm not going to put you in the weeds on it. Uh, it. I put it up here just so if you want to dig a little deeper later. It's called the Edict of Milan. Um, and here's what it is. In 313 AD, after 313 years after the birth, death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord, Caesar, uh, who had ostensibly come into Christianity, he had a vision at the Bridge of Milan. Um, he decreed uh, as an anti-Semite, this is what he said, anybody caught studying the Bible from a Hebrew perspective is under the penalty of torture, if not death. Because the hook-nosed Jews that killed Jesus, they, we're done with them. Therefore, when you study the sacred scriptures, you study them from a Roman or a different cultural perspective. Well, the problem with that is that this is not a Roman book. This is not an American book. It's, and, and I know this is going to stun some of you. Jesus is not a, 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 an Anglo-Saxon driving a pickup with a dog box in the back with a go vols in the back window. I know, I know that disappoints some of you, but he's not. He's an olive-skinned Hebrew, and he lived in Israel. So when you study, let me give you an example. If I were to get up and go and preach the gospel in Israel, and I were to preach the gospel of Knoxville, 
Well, number one, most Jews don't know where Knoxville is, but if I would say, I'm telling you on the authority of God's Word, Jesus Christ came to save you from your sins, and you ought to flee from those gripping, captivating strongholds like corn in a jar. (laughs) Oh, now you're with me. Interesting. Now, a Jew would not know what that meant. In fact, if you're visiting and you're not from this area, perhaps you don't know what that means. Let me say it in a biblical way. Wine is a mocker, and strong drink will bring great sorrow. But if I said it in our acronym, in our axiom, and I said, you ought to stay away from corn in a jar. (laughs) Now, you know I'm not talking about corn in a jar. Y'all say amen. Amen. So here's what happened. I would would read the Bible and and the very text that we we just considered right there. Here's, Here's what happened to me in my own private praise and prayer time one day. I'm, I'm reading this text, and, and as I go through it, I'm reading it, and, and I'm pastoring. Uh, I'm, I'm, I, I think I'm trying to be faithful. I'm passionate. I get up and preach. I've, I've sought a word from God. I preached till my suit was soaked, till my lungs were, 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 were heaving, till my voice was gone. I'd preach and just beg people, and I'm telling you, if I'd have said, if you love your mama, nobody would come forward. And I was frustrated, and I didn't understand what was going on. So I'm in this text one day, and, and I stumble upon Matthew 4, and, and, and I'm watching Jesus walk along the shores of the Galilee, and he just saunders up to what I'm ultimately going to discover one day is uh, Peter and his brother Andrew, who history will tell you, peripheral history will establish without any debate, that, that Simon Peter and his brother Andrew are, are on the single greatest fishing company, the most affluent successful fishing company in all of the North Galilee. He's a very wealthy individual. And here comes Jesus. He's just walking down the shore, stops and looks at these two old boys and says, hey, won't y'all come with me? And the Bible says they dropped their nets, got out of the boat and went with him. And I said to the Holy Ghost, because not only is he going to do it, are they going to do it, but the Bible immediately says, which we don't have time to take apart, is he walks a little further down the shore and there's two sons of thunder, John, the sons of Zebedee. These two boys are in the boat with their dad and he says the same thing to them. Hey boys, come on with me. They drop their nets and go. And I said to the, I said to the Lord, Lord, you've got to be kidding me. I have, I've labored, I, I've, I've preached, I've prayed, I've fasted, I've begged, I've cried, I've preached till I don't have a voice, and you walk right up to these fellows and they just go with you. Now, I know what you're saying, Pastor, you're not Jesus. Thank you, Captain Obvious. I understand that. You don't have to tell. Here's my, here was my problem. How is it that, that this man could walk up to two of the most successful? I mean, Peter is, is, is known as the most successful, affluent fisherman in all of the Galilee. And then you got the Sons of Thunder Fishing Company. <laughs> I'll tell you what we're going to do when we get to heaven. Most of y'all are going to be in a remedial class. I'm just telling you right now. <laughs> How is it that immediately they follow? Well, what I discovered, not only had I been, had I, we been robbed of our cultural understanding of the Bible, then something serious in, in my spirit took place. The Holy Spirit showed me a contrast. And if you don't hear anything else I say today, I really pray you'll, you'll just kind of close in for a moment. Just, just, just close in and listen to what I'm going to say to you. When, when the church was born in Acts chapter 2, from Acts chapter 2 to about Acts chapter 10... It is almost, at least from what we understand, it is exclusively Jewish. All the, all the new believers are Hebrews. Now, when you watch the new church, the church that's birthed in the upper room from Acts 2 to Acts 10, they face all kinds of persecution. And they have unbelievable scandals. I'm telling you, they took an offering up one, one day and, and two folk withheld from God and God killed them. Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus. No, I'm just, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. That, can you imagine, before you get to the Waffle House this afternoon, that it's all over East Tennessee, a bunch of radical, fanatical, pew-jumping, hanky-waving, Bible-preaching nuts up there at Fairview, took up an offering and two didn't give, and God killed them dead. Anything you want to say, Pastor Richie, right now? <laughs> 
But watch the contrast. Watch this. Wait, wait. It gets, it's more to that. They, they, face, they face deep religious persecution, civil prosecution. They are ostracized, criticized, stigmatized. They, they, they are in the throes of it. But watch them. Watch them. They stay the course. They keep the faith. Now, contrast that to First Baptist Church of Corinth. First Baptist of Corinth, and if you don't know this, there's two books in the Bible, First and Second Corinthians. Contrast it. Here they are. Now, now they're believers, but they're marked by division and fighting and argument and partisism and politicism. In fact, there's things going on in their fellowship that Paul said, it is so bad. I'm t-. He said, it's so bad, it's not even named among the heathen what you're doing. He said, it is, it is, it is it, it's as if the stomach turns in Corinth. That's how bad it is. It's unbelievable. Y'all are fighting, fussing, divided. You, you, you just in a And I said to myself, I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. You, the, you have a Jewish, predominantly Jewish church until Acts chapter 10. Then the gospel breaks into the Gentile community. That's what we are, unless you're Jewish. Now, it doesn't matter what you are if you're born again. The moment you became a child of God, behold, every man and woman is a new creation in Christ. You understand that? Your, your identity is no longer your ethnicity. Your identity is in Christ. But watch the experience. How is it that... that the early Hebrew church stayed the course, kept the faith, stood all of the fiery trials. It doesn't mean that they're perfect, but then when you get to First Baptist Corinth on the heels of, of Acts chapter 10, they fly apart. L- listen to me, listen to me. Here's the difference. There's a cultural difference in the heart of the Hebrew because the Hebrew didn't pray a prayer in order to transact a deal with God to get out of hell The Corinthians prayed a prayer so as not to go to hell. The Hebrews accepted a Lord who they wanted to know intimately. The Hebrews, now watch what they do. There's a rhythm to their their experience. They continue to just keep going back to the temple, keep going back to the temple, keep going back to the temple. Why? Because there was an integral part that Christ had poured into these men and women and he wasn't raising people to pray a prayer, walk an aisle, pray a prayer, get in a baptismal pool and sit down on a pew. That's not what he was doing. He modeled in such a powerful way that what he was saying was, I'm not simply coming to get you out of hell. I'm coming to change you, radically transform you so that not only are you not going to hell for the sins that I paid for, you're going to experience the intimacy of my presence. The Corinthians had prayed a prayer. They knew him as Savior, which in the New Testament, depending on what translation you might uh, prefer, uh, the word Savior is mentioned 38 times in the New Testament. The word Lord, karios, is mentioned 737 times in the New Testament. See, the Hebrews understood something that, that, that most people in America don't understand today. They, the Hebrews understood Jesus is the Lord of their life, not just the Savior of their soul. Now, how did they integrate that? How, how do you make that transition from cultural consumeristic meism into following Jesus, moving in intimacy with him? Now, what I'm about to present uh, is highly controversial. I've not preached this, to the best of my knowledge, I've, I, I've not preached this in about eight years here, and there's a reason. <laughs> and when I tell you the reason, uh, I probably won't preach it for another eight years. <laughs> so I, I shared all that with you to simply say this. Once I discovered that I am dealing with a Hebrew document that is immersed in Hebrew culture, and you cannot understand it, you can't implement it, you can't apply it, If you force American Christianity on this book, you are going to become bored, indifferent, aggravated. You're going to become frustrated with your Christianity. And most of the pastors that I talk to today that are walking away from the ministry, this is what they say. They will say to me in some form or fashion, this is what they say. I'm not giving up on the gospel. I'm just done with the American church. Because the American church wants to walk an aisle, pray a prayer, get in a baptistry, and they want to turn the pastor who's supposed to call them to follow Jesus into a chaplain and a psychologist, not an equipper, so they can find who they are in Jesus. 
Now, how do you change that kind of culture? What I'm going to submit to you this morning is, is my own, and it's not, a, it's not a matter of fellowship in this house. We're not going to fight over this. But it is a deep historical conviction that uh, it's a journey that I took over a number of years. Um, they are called the silent years. From about the age of 12, in fact, at the age of 12, we have no record of Jesus from 12 until 30, his baptism in the Jordan with John the Baptist, John chapter 1. Uh, many call it the silent years, and I did too because that's how I was theologically trained. And we were told something like this, because when Americans don't have an answer, we'll make one up. <laughs> right? <laughs> we just make, let, me, let me give you one, and I pray this doesn't hurt anybody's feelings. I'm not being ugly, but I'm just going to tell you this is what we do. You suffer some tragic loss. God forbid, you, you, you go through the valley of the shadow of death and some untimely death that makes no sense in the logic of this world. This is what preachers will say. In fact, I heard, I, the, I heard a deacon say this to my wife when our first child in her pregnancy, we found out that that little one was not going to live, didn't live. This a deacon came into the parson, sat down and between my wife and I, put his hand on her knee and his hand on my knee, and this is what he said. But we were still weeping. I had the recorder where I was going to tape the... Uh, record the heartbeat of our of our first child and because we lived away from home and I was going to play it over the phone to her mom and dad so they could hear the heartbeat of their grandchild. And he, that's what he said. That's what he said. He patted just as cold and he patted us on the knee. That's what he said. Well, you know, a couple things here, preacher. You're young. You probably don't know this. Uh, God probably needed an angel in his garden. Okay, number one, that may sound cute, but it's wrong. You are not an angel. You are bought with a price. And there's never been an angel that was bought at Calvary. You were made higher than the angels. In fact, you sing songs this morning. They cannot sing because they've never been bought. Our child made it to heaven, but it is not an angel hanging out in God's garden. Then he said this. And preacher, there's probably something wrong with that kid. You didn't want to be burdened with a kid that wasn't right. And God just said, well, I'm going to take it home. But listen to me. Both of those are wrong. And what we do in America when we don't have an answer is we make stuff up and we make a mess instead of just being quiet and letting God be God. So when, when, I, when, when I was struggling with, now wait a minute, wait a minute. How does Jesus just get up and walk down the shore and say, to one of the most successful businessmen, two of the most successful businesses in the upper Galilee, hey, you guys come with me, and they drop everything and go. I mean, let's just be honest. Can we be honest for just a skinny minute? Say yes, because we're going to do it anyway. The whole point of today, the whole reason that we've gone to all this labor and energy and effort to get you to go by to see what God is doing is because while we are an above average church in a lot of ways, we are average in this way. 20% in this house do 80% of all the work and 80% are freeloaders. Right. Hello? <laughs> Y'all okay? Because <laughs> it's going to get worse, honey. Buckle up, sweetheart. Here's, here's the problem. Here's the problem. The problem is we've told you that there's a bad place called hell, and it is, and that, that we ought to motivate you to get to heaven, and there is. But the problem is that's not what God was doing. It is to get out of hell. He don't want you to go to hell. He does want you to come to heaven. But the, the, the purpose of what he's going to do is not primarily to remove you from one very bad place to get you to one very happy place. It is to do something in you now. So I'm struggling with this, and as, as I begin to walk through this, I've really got this perplex, perplex, perplexing question. What, what is happening? What's crippling the American church? And why did the Hebrew church in its infancy, was it able to stay the course and, and follow God regardless of the price, name the name of Jesus? And, and, and the Corinthian church, who was far wealthier, far more affluent, they disintegrated in the heat of the moment. What's the difference? So let's circle back around. Where was Jesus from 12 to 30? Well, the American answer is his daddy was a carpenter. And Jesus had one of them craftsman tool belts with a hammer and a saw. And he was building beds for wholesale Knoxville wholesale furniture. 
That's why you ought to go see Tim and Robin. They sell Holy Ghost beds built by Jesus. <laughs> Jesus was a carpenter. <laughs> Amen? Right. Lord, we need some cabinets. Jesus, would you build my wife some cabinets? You're a carpenter. And that's what we were told. Because the, new, the King James translates the word in the Greek as tekton, which means a master stone craftsman. If you ever go to Israel, there are no trees. They didn't build houses like we build them here. They built stone, and that's what, that's what his stepfather was. He was a tecton. He was a master. In fact, if you, once you ever see it, you can't ever see it. That's why it calls us living stones, not living trees. <laughs> You're not a chest of drawers. <laughs> now, your chest may have fell in your drawers, but that's not what you are. <laughs> Amen? Y'all, we're going to get this sermon out. One way or another, y'all going to get up in here with me. All the guilty, you're laughing. Let's get out of here right now, preacher. <laughs> I can feel the cards and letters coming right now. Where was Jesus? He wasn't hanging out in his father's carpentry shop. Number one, there is no carpentry shop because his father was employed by the single largest employer of the day, which was a, which was a beautiful uh, is, uh, uh, granite quarry in Nazareth that was, that was preparing the ornament stones for the largest construction project in, in the nation at that time for over 180 years called Herod's Temple. And it had very little wood. In fact, when Israel had to have wood, they didn't have enough. They had to import it. Check the Old Testament. The cedars of Lebanon from the north. Why? Because Israel didn't have any wood. So where is Jesus? From 12 to 30. And what does it have to do with discipleship? Well, let me give that to you very quick. Y'all okay? Yeah. Every man in here sucked it up. Just <laughs> Watch this. Here's what, here's what a Hebrew boy would do. From the age of 6 to 10 years old, a Hebrew boy and girl would go to Bet Safar. Bet Safar is, is the word for house of the book. So from six to ten years of age, Jewish children were taught and they memorized the Torah. That's the first five books of the Bible. They memorized every bit of it. I have parents say to me time to time, y'all expect too much out of them children. <laughs> you better be glad you're not a Hebrew. Uh, the rabbi would put honey on the slate as he taught them the word in the morning. They would meet in the morning. Uh, to memorize and, and to uh, dig into the Torah. He would put um, honey on it out of Psalm 119.03 because the, the word is honey and it would motivate them. The majority of Jewish kids would finish with school uh, after this. They were done by the age of 10. And most of the children at this point um, would go back to their um, family trade. Now, that seems a little bit like of a, a criticism or um, that, you know, a 10-year-old, perhaps they were being a little bit... Um, negative but that's not the truth that's not what's going on they would simply this is what they were doing from six to ten they were teaching them the first five books of the old testament in in uh bet shafar because they were when they sent them back to whatever the family or whatever vocation they were going to do here's the difference they were doing it as under the glory of the lord they had a christ they had oh, i said that wrong they had a biblical worldview that they weren't just fishermen they were doing it for the glory of Yahweh so if a if, if a if a nine-year-old a ten-year-old got ready to go to worship and you know boys you get them ready for church they're gonna find a mud hole say amen. amen so you take a Hebrew boy he's all he's got his Talid on he's ready to go to synagogue and and he steps out in the front yard and there lays a, a dead chicken and he picks it up and chases his sister with it and his mama's gonna say to him boy what does the book of Leviticus say and instantly he's going to say, thou shalt touch no dead thing lest you become unclean. So his mama has referred back to the authority of Scripture so that now he understands he's just messed up the whole day of worship because Levitically he's unclean. Now he's got to, he, and he understands, mom's not punishing me, dad's not being meaner to me than he is his sister, even though he beat her half death with dead chicken. He's in trouble because the word, now how does he know that? Because from the time he was six years old, he's been immersed in the word of God. So at 10, they're typically released, they have a biblical worldview. American Christianity does it the very opposite. We give very little Bible, 
you know, if the ball field doesn't get in our way. Preacher, we can't give nothing to the renovation. Why? We spent $11,000 on travel ball. If you ain't mad yet, hold on. I'm coming after you. So when they're done with Bet Shafar, they, they typically would go in. Now, those who showed a propensity, those, those, those that, that had a, a, an ability from 10 to 14, they're going to Bet Talmud. This is the house of learning. Not many would, would, would engage in this. Because most, once they got their biblical worldview, they, they, they moved into some vocation. Uh, they were tested for memorization, not only the first five books, but all of the prophets and all of the writings. And then they were questioned to determine whether or not they had a level of interest in, in an ability to apply intellectually and to form their own interrogation of the sacred text. Now, let me tell you why this is important. Because what they're doing is, in their community, they're putting the Word of God above everything else. And they're looking to form leaders that will perpetuate a biblical worldview. So those that were 10 to 14 that ended up in Bet Talmud, and, and they were able to take the Word not just academically, not just devotionally, but they were able to interrogate it and hold it up and move in it with a propensity, they were moved to a deeper level. Now, this is how uh, every Jewish boy and girl, regardless whether it was Bet Shafar or Bet Talmud, they were celebrated at what would be called for the girl a, bar, a bat mitzvah and for the boy a bar mitzvah. For example, let me show you. You know that... Um, Mary and Joseph, the stepfather of Jesus, I think personally they had gone to the Feast of uh, Tabernacles. And uh, Jesus is 12 years old, and they do what all of us, some of us have done. They left their kid at church. I left both of mine several times. They kept bringing them home. <laughs> so they, they get out of the city, and they're on their way. And somebody said, well, I thought I, you left him with Uncle so-and-so. No, I thought he was with Aunt whoever. I thought he was hanging out with his best friend. Well, nobody can find him. I think this was, now this is not a point of fellowship. I think this was his bar mitzvah. I think specifically because it's the Feast of Tabernacles, which has a powerful prophetic overture that he will dwell with us and we will dwell with him forever, that he was bar mitzvah. He came into his manhood at, at 12 years of age, and you know the rest of the story. He is in his bar mitzvah where he's being questioned. He so astounded the, the great, religious minds of the moment that they're in a protracted conversation with him. His mom and dad come back to the city of Jerusalem and say, hey, where are you doing? And they said, this kid, this, this kid right here, something's different. Now, if a child from Bet Shafar to Bet Talmud showed a specific gifting you remember, you remember I said I couldn't understand how is it that Jesus could walk up to that shoreline and say, hey, you going to go me? Now, I, can't, I can say it in the Greek, but if I say it the way it ought to be said, you're going to make fun of me, and I'm going to spit on the whole three rows, and you're not going to remember how I said it. It's a very specific word when he said, come follow me. It's a very unique, specific Greek uh, or Ar Ar Aramaic phrase, and it literally, it literally means this. Would you like to be my disciple? Now, I want you to look up here and I want you to listen to me because I'm about to nail something in the spirit of religion. In the heart of every believer, that's what they want to hear. We're, we're sick. Are you not sick of religion? Is anybody else in this room? Not, I, don't, I pray you don't take this wrong. Please don't hear what I'm not saying. Please don't hear what I'm not saying. As, as much as I know there's, there, there, it's the heart and the mind of God through the miracle of, of, of 90 acres on Tazewell Pike, I understand that. And it, it may be the heart, mind, and will of God that someday we build a facility there so that we can worship in a way that perhaps we're prohibited here in a, in a way and do ministry perhaps we can't do on this hillside. I, I don't know that yet. You don't know that. But I don't want you to hear me. That doesn't excite me near as much as you finding out why he bought you. 
It doesn't excite me near as much as you beginning to function in the unction that when he bought you at Calvary and he set you apart and gifted you to do what only you could do, nothing, there's not a building, there's not a multi-million dollar anything that excites me more than seeing you walk in the intimacy of the Father so that when it comes to the point and place where you are persecuted, prosecuted, when you are railed on, that you stand flat-footed like the Hebrews, where did they get this kind of tenacity? Why do they keep going to the temple? Why do they keep holding to the faith? Why is First Baptist Corinth melting in division and partisism when the first, when the first church in, in, in Jerusalem is holding to the stuff? Because Jesus was a rabbi. That's, they call him rabbi all throughout the word of God. It's not an honorary title. How do you know that? Because if he showed a particular ability to handle the word of God... A rabbi would walk up and every Hebrew boy wanted to hear their rabbi say, you want to follow me? You want to go with me? And this is why. They've been memorizing the first five books of the Old Testament. Somebody tell me, what's the first book of the Old Testament? Genesis. In Genesis chapter 3, there's a prophecy. That prophecy says that from the seed of the woman is coming Yahshua Messiah, the one who's going to correct the corruption of the world and the division between man and their creator, he said through the womb of a woman is coming Yahshua Messiah. Every Hebrew girl, every Hebrew girl that loved God, let me tell you what they prayed every night before they, they laid their head down. Father Yahweh, you promised that through the seed of the woman would come the Redeemer to correct all this craziness in the world. Now I want you to think about Mary praying that. That'll mess up some wedding invitations right there, buddy. God said, I heard you praying, Mary. I'm going to do it. Joseph slipped in one day. And he said, Mary, you've been a little off. She said, well, I got to tell you something. <laughs> uh, I've not been feeling right lately. He said, well, I'll tell you, you've been looking a little puffy. I'm, I mean, I'm... <laughs> we don't say puffy. We're going to get a divorce before we get married. You say that again. <laughs> Do you ever wonder why Joseph didn't put her away? The Bible says he was a righteous man. That does not mean that he lived perfectly. It meant that as a little boy in Bet Shafar and in, in Bet Torah, he had so memorized and digested the word that he knew that one day through the womb of a woman was coming the Messiah. And he looked at her and said, you're going to be the one, aren't you? That's why he stayed the course. Does that not change it for you? Jesus so handled the word of God that his rabbi said to him, you won't come with me? Now, this is not a point of contention or fellowship, but I, do, I believe with all of my heart that Jesus did not return to the, valley, to, the, to the village of Nazareth from this point on. Because this was the dream for every parent in, in the Hebrew culture. Every parent wanted to raise a little boy who so digested, memorized the word of God that out of Bet Shofar and into Bet Talmud, that when it came time for their bar mitzvah, that their rabbi would say, there's something different about that one right there. And he would walk up and he would say, do you want to follow me? And the little boy would say, yes, I want to follow you. I want to be everything God's made me to be. And the dad would say, may the dust of the rabbi cover you. Because a rabbi had the authority to pull Oh, how many was it? Let's see. Coincidentally, incidentally, accidentally, 12 <laughs> disciples. Isn't that something? I had a guy tell me one time, preacher, I don't believe that. That 12 is because most of them could fit in a van. I said, man, I can't fix your stupid. I mean, I can't even fix your stupid. I, mean, I can't. I can't fix it. In, 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 the, in the Bet Midrash, the house of study, sometimes translated uh, study hall or the construction of a house. Remember, Paul uses the analogy, you are a house of God, meaning that you're continually under some beautiful construction. A disciple, if, when they're disciples, they called them little children. So when you read John, 1 John, and he says, my little children, he's not talking about kids in the nursery. He's talking about those of you who have didn't, didn't pray a prayer. You didn't just get out of hell. You decided, I'm following Jesus. I want the dust of the rabbi on me. I want to be so close to him. Now, now 
in order of 12 disciples, in order for you to have the dust of the rabbi on you, you had to be one of the most committed, tuned in. You had to be one of the most passionate students because only those who really wanted to be poured into, and they wore sandals, they wore sandals, pumas. <laughs> tough room, KD, tough room. So when Jesus is walking and he's, and, and, and he's teaching, that's how he did it. He didn't, he didn't just set them down in some boring seminar. They're doing life together. And as he's walking those dusty trails and that dust is popping up off the back of his sandals, at the end of the day when they sat down, the, the young man, the little children who would be anywhere from, from 14 to 30 years of age and they're looking at, at around the fire getting ready to eat, the one that had the dust on them was the one that had been the closest all day. Now, there is one other component before we close this message out. After um, Bet Mirah, I'm told by Hebrew historians, there's only a handful of these that ever existed in the history of Israel in all of her history. It's called Chmika. And it is, it's an anointing and an authority that rarely ever existed. And it's simply this. It, it, the Pharisees and the Sadducees taught in their own authority. If a rabbi had an unusual anointing to teach, and for example, it would be said of him, the evidence and the ability to teach is no other. Does that ring familiar to you in the Bible? Remember what they said in, 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 in the Gospel of Luke? This guy teaches like nobody we've ever heard. That's smika. It's an anointing. He's teaching with an intimacy with the Father. Now, not only does he have an authority to teach as no other, He's got an anointing to teach us. He's got an authority to call disciples. He could walk into a village and and receive support financially, and he could say to your son, hey, do you want to follow me? And and he could build his 12 disciples and spend, typically a rabbi spent, hmm, what was it? Three years. It's an American book, but there are a lot of coincidences in it. (laughs) His teaching or his authority was called a yoke. So when Jesus said, Come unto me for my yoke is easy. That's not some agrarian mystical uh, 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 reference. They immediately say, wait, wait a minute. You mean you're not teaching like the others? You're not teaching I got to work my way up there. I got to be good enough to get to go. He said, no, that's not what I'm teaching. In fact, let me tell you, I'm going to use some words going to blow your religious mind. You could know Abba. His responsibility was to teach his children to do greater things. So he didn't teach them just part of what he knew to keep them submitted. He taught them so that they would exceed what he had. That's why he said to them, you'll do greater things. Now I want you to think with me before I close this message. We're almost done. I want you to think about this. What is the Son of God doing? Submitting himself to this. Why, why would he go to preschool, elementary, and co- why would he do this? Because what he wants us to understand is if all you ever experience is the forgiveness of your sin and not the presence of him, you're going to miss Christianity. So this is, this is what he's going to do. He's going to teach them, and this is the practical application. This is where most people lose the essence of Christianity. I'm going to give you three things, and we're done. He wants you to know that you have a purpose. He did not primarily, his chief end and goal was not merely to get you out of hell. It was to bring you into an intimate relationship with him so that you could follow him daily and experience the incredible. So he's got a purpose for you. Now, now I'm going to give you a test real quick. There's There's no failing, but I'm going to give it to you real quick. I'm going to read this to you, and I'm going to ask you a question. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I've come that that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Now, in American Christianity, um, I want to ask you a question. Be honest. Who have we been taught that that thief is? Come on, y'all. I'm not going to to point you out. Who, Who have we been taught? Satan. Okay, here's the issue. This is why we get in trouble in the Bible. We allow religion to impose itself. That's not who he's talking about. You have to check the context. The context of the text is this. The thief is not the enemy, Satan. 
The thief is the spirit of religion. So he, what, he's, what he's saying is, he's, he's identifying the Pharisees, Sadducees, the, the zealots, the religious, who absolutely hate the fact that he's inviting people into an intimate relationship. I'm talking about brothels and barkeepers and tax collectors and, 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 and Florida Gator fans. Do you understand what I'm saying? Anybody move, shoot them. <laughs> See, we've been told this is Satan. Let me, let, me tell you, let me tell you what's trying to keep you from your purpose. Spirit of religion. Let me tell you what the spirit of religion will say. You need to walk this aisle, pray this prayer, sign this card, get in that water, and you need to sit down and let the professionals do it, and don't you try this at home. And the problem is, it's robbing you of the very thing that he bought you for. You have a divine purpose. In that moment that he came and got you, I'm telling you on the authority of God's word. It does, look, preacher, you don't know what I've done in the past. You're right, I don't. Let me tell you something else. He's got no record of what you did in the past. He has absolutely no record. He's put it in the sea of forgetfulness and post posted a sign that said no fishing here. He separated as far as the east is from the west and he's more interested in what you are in him than what you did before you got to him. You have a divine purpose and the American model is built on this. Preacher, we're going to come and sit and we're going to wait for you to entertain us and if you don't entertain us at the level we want and if you bring up giving and make us uncomfortable, things like travel ball will probably go somewhere else. <laughs> Bye. See ya. Wouldn't want to be you because if that's Christianity, I'm done too. I, I, I don't want to sit. Do we gather for a purpose? Yes, we gather for a purpose to be equipped. We gather for the purpose to find out what our purpose is. But if this is the extent of what it means to be a believer, then I just say, let's sell the building and go to Dollywood. Amen? They have cotton candy. I got to hurry. Not, not only, not, he, he put them, he immersed them in this process, he became because he's setting a pattern. And it, it, this, it, this will be, sometimes you'll hear people say this. Well, I don't, I don't know how to live the Christian life. Yes, you do. It's right here in the Bible. L listen to what it says. It's very, it's very easy. He says it. Uh, then Jesus answered and said unto them, Most assuredly I say to you that the Son can do nothing. How, can do what? Yeah. A absolutely. This is the Son of God. <laughs> this is the one stepped out of nowhere, stood on nothing, and told light, Come here. And at 187,000 miles per second, boom, it popped up. He's the one put the moon in the sky, told the sun when to come up. He's the one told the rivers where to flow. This is, and he says, I can do nothing? You've got to be kidding me. He has so condescended, he has so submitted himself. And this is the great struggle in the American church. The American church can do everything without him because we vote. And we don't like what you say, we'll vote you out. <laughs> well, here's the problem. Oftentimes, the very thing that's aggravating you the most is the very thing God sent. And we're too quick to be a democracy in the American model instead of submitted to the Spirit. And sometimes we're running from the very thing that's making us trust Him the most. And when we can do all things without Him, we're in trouble every time. Here's the pattern. Now, I'm going to just shoot it straight to you. This is, in fact, you're not going to receive this in your flesh. This is the spirit of religion. Here it goes. Here's how, here's how you do it. Preacher, how do I live for Jesus? Get full of the Holy Spirit and do whatever you want to do. Whew, golly, boy, tough room, y'all. Man, it's 7,000 degrees up here. Will you help me out a little bit? Get full of the Holy Ghost and just do whatever you want to do. Now, preacher, what does that mean? That means this, that if I am filled with the Holy Spirit and I ask the Holy Spirit, this is a living, breathing example. I asked the Holy Spirit when I saw her come through the back door of that Baptist church, I said to the Holy Spirit, I would like to date her. And the Holy Spirit said, we should. <laughs> now, see, if you're religious, let me tell you what you just said. He's schizophrenic. <laughs> no, no, you're a goober. <laughs> I have the God of all eternity living inside of me. And when I saw her, the Holy Spirit said, woohoo. <laughs> she sat next to you, you better amen it. When I, when I saw her, the Holy Spirit said, woohoo. Yes. yes, sir. <laughs> That's what's wrong with some of y'all. Y'all ain't woohooed. <laughs> you mean 
need to tell me, preacher, I can do whatever I want to do at any time, yes. Because if you're full of the Holy Spirit, he's never going to lead you to do what you shouldn't do. And if you do what you shouldn't do, he'll lead you not to do it. And we've complicated it. People call me all the time, preacher, uh, we want to go see this movie. We were just wondering if you and Miss Christy knew anything about it. Could we go? I don't know. I'm not the Holy Ghost. I don't know. I'm not a movie reviewer. I'm a Bible preacher, Goober. I don't know. Ask the Holy Spirit. Let's do it. Let's try it right now. How many of you, how many of you believe what I just said? Say amen. amen. I want you to repeat after me. Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit. tell me now. Should I tithe? <laughs> Woohoo! I ain't doing it. I ain't going to do it. <laughs> then don't ask. See, here's the pattern. This what, watch what he does. He said, I'm not going to do anything I don't see the Father doing. Half of you are not doing what you're supposed to do because you didn't ask the Father what he wants you to do. And some of you are doing what you're not supposed to do. And you're in somebody else's way and they're not doing what they're supposed to do because you're doing what they're supposed to do. And because you saw a need instead of a call, you got in somebody else's way. Well, Brother Jeff, I'll tell you, I'm just going to go down there and change diapers in the name of Jesus. Won't nobody do it. I say bring them in here with the diaper dirty. Hand them to somebody full of poop. And say in Jesus' name, somebody got to change this diaper because it's not my calling. How do you know it's not your calling, preacher? Because I gag. (laughs) Scares the children. I have four girls. I've changed one diaper. And it's none of theirs. It was his. His mother left me with him. I fed him cheese for three days. Three days I shoved cheese in him. She got home late. He blew like a volcano. I took him out back with a garden hose. She pulled in the driveway. I sprained him down. She said, what are you doing? I had him upside down, poop dripping off of him. I said, I gagged. It's not my call. How do you know? I asked the Holy Ghost. Should we change diapers? He said, no, you gag. There's a pattern. All you got to do is say to the Father, Father, you know what? Every time I see, every time I walk past that place, something, something in me leaps, something in me. But you, you, you're doing something. Every time I walk by that fifth grade room, every time I walk by that, that place with the students, every time I walk by, something's inside of me saying, you ought to go in there. That's God in you telling you, come here. I got something in there for you. And I promise you on the authority of God's word, you've never lived a Christian life till you do what he created you to do. I'm telling you, there's no high like the most high. And if you'll just do what he bought you to do, you'll absolutely never get bored with Christianity. Now, guys, will you hit the button because I'm out of time. Now, listen, there's a purpose. He made you for a purpose. There's a pattern. Just watch what he's doing and go join him. You'll see him at work and you'll be drawn to it. How in the world... Did we move here, five and a half hours away from the place we planned on dying? How did we move? Because we we walked in this building. I told my family, on the way here, on the way here, I said, we're not going there. I am not moving there. But we're going to go and we're going to pray with this pulpit committee. And we might have somebody we could recommend. Pulled up in the parking lot, stepped my feet on the ground, and the Holy Ghost said, come here. (laughs) Come here. And I went home and packed. You, you, you see, all, all you got to do is just follow him. But there, there, listen, there's, there's a purpose. There's a pattern. There's a price. You're never going to find out what your purpose is, and you're never going to see what he's doing, the pattern, until you die to yourself. Because yourself will always talk you out of walking in the Spirit. Every time. You'll have a whole list of reasons you should not do what God's calling you to do because self does not want to die. It will not crawl up on that cross. You have got to make a conscious decision. I'm going to die to myself. And you've got to get up and do it every day. And if you need practice, drive through halls. (laughs) Just drive through halls. And you'll pray God had Gatling guns behind your headlights so you could move people (laughs) out of the way. Most believers never find out their purpose and they never live in the pattern of the Spirit 
because they're not willing to pay the price. And because they won't die to themselves, they never ever get to experience the fullness of everything God's got for them. See, we're not trying to recruit you to come help us do something. We're inviting you to get in on what God's already doing in this house. You see the difference? Because if us recruiting you to do something you don't want to do, that's not going to last. We're just going to have to keep propping you up and propping you up and propping and begging and pleading and manipulating and, and asking you to come back. No. When you find out what you were made for and why he called you here, ain't no, hell, no force in hell can stop you. Doesn't matter whether you like me, hate me, want to kill me. Doesn't matter if you like folks in the balcony or not. That's why they sit up there. They don't like y'all down here. They told me. I went up there one time, pulled, and they said, I said, why y'all sit up here? They said, we don't like these people down here. I said, why do you keep coming? They said, God called me here. I just made all that up because y'all weren't paying attention to the thing I said. <laughs> Listen to me. I, I promise I'm done right here. Famous last words. We're, we're, we're at a crossroads in this church. About 65 to 70% of you in this room in two services have no connection to the Father and the fellowship in this house outside of this room. We love having you. We love worshiping with you. We love getting together and lifting up the name of Jesus. But here's the truth of the matter. Outside of this room, you have no roots, you have no relationship. God didn't bring you here just for a pep rally called worship. He called you here because you have something inside of you that somebody else in this, fe- in this fellowship needs from you. And I know what you're saying because this is American Christianity. Well, that's what we pay you for. <laughs> you're smoking crack. <laughs> that's not what you pay me for. And let me just ask you something. Do you think, uh, before God, do you think that, that, that I have the time or the ability to do all that? I, I can't. I'm not supposed to. You, you have it. You've walked through the valley of the shadow of death. You've, you've trusted God. You've seen God do the impossible. You've walked in places. Listen, you, you've seen God do things my family's never seen before. And the, and the brokering of the Spirit is this. Don't come see the pastor. Ask the pastor. I'm walking through this valley with this label over it, and I'm able to say, hey, I know my sheep. I know them. And I've watched them. I want to introduce you to a family who has seen God do the impossible, the improbable, because when it came time to follow Jesus, they pressed in. And I can't do for you what they can do. And you know what will happen? I can leave tomorrow, but you're tethered to them and to him. And this church keeps going because you're not in a personality You're in the person of Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Father, in Jesus' name, we pray you dismantle the spirit of religion that lies to us, that has uh, seduced us and deceived us to believe that somehow or another we're just saved enough to get into heaven and out of hell. We pray in Jesus' name right now for those who have grown bored and cold and indifferent. It's not a question of whether or not they know you. It's a question of whether or not do they follow you. Would you, Holy Spirit of the living God, in this Cairo season, call servants unto yourself that you might build a great fellowship founded in you. For it's in your name we pray. Amen.